Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for being here today. Um, thank you for joining us on a what we hope is some very good positive steps forward on a growing crisis in our city. Um, we're joined by a number of people behind me. I won't introduce all of them, but you're going to hear from a number of people today, um, including Deborah and Jed, who tragically lost their son um, to a fentanyl overdose. And we are seeing a growing number of uh, crises of this in cities across America, and Seattle is no exception. Today, the city will be announcing a number of life-saving tools that we will be taking to combat the effects of fentanyl and counterfeit fentanyl-laced pills. We know that illicit fentanyl and counterfeit fentanyl-laced pills is a growing problem in Seattle. And just to give you some context on how quickly this has changed on our streets, in 2018, Seattle Police Department seized 187 fentanyl pills or fentanyl lace pills, 187 for all of 2018. In 2019, we seized 220,000. And in 2020 to date, we're not even through January, over 40,000. We are seeing this epidemic in cities across America. I've talked to, to mayors throughout, and we are seeing it's a growing problem. We know that this drug is dangerous. Um, in all of our opiate crisis is dangerous, but when, when laced with fentanyl, it really poses a different health concern. In 2019, our Seattle paramedics administered over 330 doses of Narcan, or the naloxone as it's called, um, 330 times. That's saving lives. Um, but tragically, we lost eight teenagers in 2019 due to fentanyl-laced pills. Um, let me say that again, eight teenagers. You know, we just had a very tragic incident last week where we had a shooting and lost a life and other people were injured. And yet, almost under the radar, eight teenagers in Seattle lost their life because of this danger. The Seattle Police Department, together with King County Sheriff's Office, the DEA, and FBI, have ongoing investigations related to the manufacture and sale of these drugs. But in addition to these law enforcement efforts, we know to really reduce the harm here, we have to take some proven harm reduction strategies. Um, we have to combat this opioid epidemic everywhere we can to keep people healthy and safe in our community. I really want to recognize um, the people who are standing with me today who have gone through the tragedy themselves. We know that Deborah, Jed, and David have turned one of the most tragic things parents can suffer into something that is positive for their community. Uh, and I think all of us mourn the loss of Gabe. His brother and sister here today, please don't take their pictures, but they're incredibly brave too, and they carry with them the hope for the future. Our kids are our hope. And so we need to make sure that we're making good choices um, with our partners to really give the tools we need so that kids first don't use the drugs, they don't take the paths that will take them down that dangerous path, and that we make sure that we're doing everything we can to give our kids that hope and that future that they deserve. Um, so I really, my, my profound gratitude to the folks who are standing with me, it, it takes a special commitment, not just to your own child, but to your community and to every child to say, we're gonna make sure this doesn't happen to other families in Seattle. Um, it, it, it really is one of the most courageous things I've been able to see as mayor. I'm not sure I could do it as a mom. Um, thanks to this, we're also taking some other steps to raise awareness because so many kids don't realize the dangers of what they are doing. And so we wanna make sure that we, we do a number of things. First, we wanna increase access to the life-saving drug, Narcan. So the city will be purchasing 700 new Narcan kits and we will making sure that we will work with our partners in the Seattle Public Schools and across the city to make sure those are available in those places 
where the people who may use the drugs may be located. We'll convene also a series of 25 trainings so that people know how to use Narcan and how to distribute it. We got to make sure that the medication gets to the places where there might end up being an overdose. And so we're partnering with the Seattle Public Schools, as I said, and making sure that all the nurses in schools are trained with this life-saving thing. We're also going to be working with the um, uh, Office of Economic Development is working with our nightlife community, and we will be having a Narcan for Nightlife program so that our establishments where people are in and around in the nightlife community are not only aware of the dangers here, but know what, how to act and what to do should someone overdose on an opioid. We also want to make sure that we conduct a number of trainings with our other community-based partners, um, whether that's in the LGBTQ community or in our youth community. We want those people who are youth that are community-based organizations to be that first front line of defense, both for education, but also if that were to happen, if an overdose is to happen, to have the tools and training to be able to administer the drug. I really want to thank our public health partners, Seattle and King County, Washington State Department of Health, the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute at the UW, for all of their guidance in helping us through this. Um, and want to give a really special recognition to the members of the Heroin and Prescription Opioid Addiction Task Force. They've been working on this um, across the region to make sure that we're not only taking the data to see what the trends are, but to really be designing how do we make sure that we are partnering with the right organizations to both have the education and the response. Um, I also um, am really um, honored to be joined with some of those community-based organizations here today um, from Youth Care, where'd you go, hiding back there, um, to Choose 180, who you're going to hear from, um, to Country Doctor, people who are in the community serving people and seeing the very bleak reality sometimes of what the opioid crisis looks like at the human level in our city and how to respond to that. Um, we have to raise awareness. I think that many youth in particular don't realize that there's all these counterfeit pills out there and they may be thinking that they're getting a, a prescription pill, um, but really it's, it is laced with fentanyl and it's deadly. Um, and we saw too many overdoses. We've already this year seen overdoses. We are starting to see um, a rise, as I said, in the number of pills that we are uh, seizing with Seattle Police Department. And I can tell you both um, as a mom and from my own youth that just saying don't do this doesn't work. You know, that is not what's going to, you know, reach youth. What you really have to do is the people they trust, their trusted, credible messengers who work with them on other phases in their life can talk to them about why would you do it? What are you thinking about? How, there's a real danger here. Um, and if we are able to do that and tap into it and make it really thing, we can make a difference in the number of people who are exposed to this deadly drug. Uh, that means expanding throughout the city. We're going to have a number of town halls everywhere in the city because we want to make sure that we're reaching people where they live. Um, we can't let this just be an episode and we announce something, we really have to build this systemically into our communities, into our schools. We've got a really important work to do, um, but it starts really with making sure that we listen. We listen to parents, to teachers, but we listen to the youth and other people who are involved too, so that we know how to counteract um, what is really a very deadly and dangerous trend in our city. And with that, I am um, so honored to introduce Deborah and Jed, who lost their son Gabe, who also want to share some remarks with you today. Thank you very much. So it was actually four months and one day ago that Gabe passed away. Um, he went out the night before with a friend, and as far as we know, it was the first time he'd ever tried something like this. 
Um, he bought something that appeared to be a prescription oxycodone pill, and he took half of it, which was enough to be a fatal dose for him very quickly. And this morning when I told my daughter that I was coming here uh, to this, she said, oh, I'm proud of you, Mom. You've always, you're standing up for my brother, and you've always stood up for us. And I said, yes. And uh, now I'm standing up not just for him, but for other people like him and their families and communities. And I think all of us can envision a future of how, what our communities can be like. And in that vision, we can see how we can have more harmony and that the standards of how we treat each other can be raised. And I really feel that we can all start doing that now in how we treat ourselves and how we are when we're driving on the road, how we interact with other people behind the counters in the grocery stores and the coffee shops because I don't feel that there is a difference in how we treat each other in these smaller ways and bigger ways. So I do really strongly feel that we can start living that now and I'm really grateful to Mayor Durkin and all her amazing staff for understanding the urgency and um, just being so compassionate and responsive um, to this and making these great first steps towards um, creating a community like that. And, you know, it's like the mayor was saying, it's not something that just stops in a few weeks, but something that we can continue working on for the rest of our lives. <clears throat> so we're here as advocates today and moving forward because, you know, I really feel that that love always wins and whenever there's something that's darkness hits in its wake, we have a choice. We can ride that wave actually with love and and like bring it forth. So I that's why I'm here today. I, I hope that by speaking out that it will help save other people's lives and um, continue to be inspiring to have continued preventative and just elevation of the standards of, of how we are with each other in this world. So, Jed. So, um, as Deborah's partner and a friend for 35 years, um, I never thought we'd be here, and I don't think any parent or step parent uh, does. Um, and I really can't fathom quite what she's going through as, as Gabe's step parent. Uh, I want to uh, mention David Lilienthal, who I had a very good relationship with and still do. Uh, Gabe's father is a wonderful man. He's in, in Australia now um, with his family um, grieving, and he deserves a lot of respect and a lot of, of credit for how he raised Gabe. Gabe was a wonderful child. He was a straight A student. I think, you know, as a product of the University of Washington's um, surgery residency, I trained a lot at Harborview. And Harborview is an amazing institution. Um, and they treat opioid uh, addiction and overdoses every day. This was a case of a different type of crisis where fentanyl, because it's so dangerous, and, and this was an education for me, because I use fentanyl every day in my practice as a surgeon, is so dangerous that, that children who are doing what I would say normal foolish children things, teenage boys especially, are affected by this crisis, but also girls, um, don't have the same landing pad, the same amount of, of, of breadth of, of safety. When I was a kid riding a motorcycle or jumping off of cliffs into the water or doing absolutely foolish things that drove, I'm sure drove my parents crazy, I, I didn't come home with but a scratch. And I was lucky. And I didn't lose one friend in my entire high school career to an opioid uh, overdose. Everybody in this room either knows somebody or will know somebody affected by this epidemic if they don't already. I am astounded by Mayor Durkin's staff and their responsiveness and how quickly 
they heard our message. When we met with Mayor Durkin, she was wonderful, and I thought, well, maybe that'll be that. That wasn't that. And within weeks, an entire team met with us and looked to us to help direct what was the next step. And they came with ideas. They came with, with um, plans. They came with, with ways that they could help us. And I was, I was overwhelmed. I mean, honestly, I, I've never been so, I guess, respected as a way. Um, Dominique is in the room, Kelsey, others. And, and they're, they're, they're a powerhouse group of people when they put their minds to it. And so I'm, I was astounded by that. Um, I just, I want to thank them for that. Um, and then Deborah has gone through something that no parent should. There are many, many crises out there. Uh, environment, um, administrative leaders showing poor choices, opioids. I think it's all part of an epidemic of exhaustion, anxiety, depression, and disconnection. Read it how you'd like, but until we inject some humanity back into how we treat everybody, each other, ourselves, our children, our neighbors, but also learning that that when you buy everything online and you don't walk up to your butcher or your, your neighborhood store and you don't greet people, you lose something in our communities. And we need to get that back. And so I just really wanted to encourage everybody to bring that and, and leave here with that, if, if anything. Uh, and thank you again. I'll pass it back to Mayor Durkin. Thank you for that. Can I just mention the names of the other four children? Uh, 100%. Okay, so the four children that, that passed away in, in September, in September others, alone, yeah, in September alone were Jasper Echo Toms at Ingram High School, Lucas Davidov at, at Skyline, Thomas Beatty at Skyline, and, and of course Gabriel Lilienthal. And I've, I have been, I've had give, been given the permission by their parents to mention them. Um, they all deserve um, enormous amount of respect and and also um, their families are, are mourning um, and I've met with all their families as have many people here and, and I just wanted to mention them that their their deaths should not go forgotten and I don't think they will thank you for that um, thank you for that I also now would like to hear from uh, the public health I've got Jim Volendroff who will talk to you a little bit about the public health data we're seeing and some of the approaches we're using on that front. We know that the opiate crisis fundamentally is a public health crisis. And you'll be hearing later from um, folks who have been involved in making sure that we don't just view this as a, um, a criminal justice problem, but a problem where we really have to invest in people. Um, so Jim, I'll give it to you now. Thank you. Um, I'd like to just start by thanking you for your courage and your strength to come here today um, and uh, your message, your message of hope. So I really appreciated that. Um, I'd also like to thank the mayor and her staff and the city of Seattle, King County for their leadership and commitment to addressing this extremely important uh, issue. Expanding the use of naloxone and providing training related to overdose awareness and assistance will undoubtedly save lives. As a member of the recovery community myself and an individual who works in the field of addiction and mental health treatment, I know firsthand individuals who are your sons and your daughters, your families, your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, who have whose lives have been saved by this very drug that we're talking about. This initiative announced today will ensure that this well-established and safe intervention that can reverse opioid overdose and pre prevent fatalities is more widely available and that more people will know how to use naloxone and to jump into action when necessary. You know, the vast it's very simple to me. The vast majority of us know what to do when somebody is having a cardiac arrest. We know how to jump into action, and many of us have been trained in CPR. And uh, the use of naloxone and its availability, to me, is the first aid in CPR for people with behavioral health crises or who find themselves uh, in this particular situation. So as the director of the Behavioral Health Institute at Harborview Medical Center, 
an institute that is designed to support innovation and to advance and test and research new successful approaches to complex mental health and addiction problems. We support the use of naloxone for the treatment of opioid overdose for first responders, bystanders, families, and others. We see it as a remarkably effective and inexpensive use of and safe medication that has no addictive potential and may be dispensed by anyone with minimal training uh, if we make it more accessible as this initiative will. Uh, as you just heard through a very personal and painful example, overdose is not limited to those living with a substance use disorder. Uh, it can happen to anyone. This is especially true with the increase of fentanyl in our community. While we're still learning more about fentanyl overdose, we're identifying that there are differences in overdose to fentanyl as compared to other opioids, including the need to seemingly administer higher doses of naloxone, and that overdose can happen much quicker, uh, requiring us to respond even faster. And finally, while it's true that overdose can happen to anyone, we should know that uh, we should all know how to respond and have the tools we need to provide assistance. Uh, and the, the, the vast majority of these overdose deaths are with people who already have drugs in their system. Um, so along with providing tools and resources to assist in the event of an overdose, we must simultaneously make sure that treatment is available for those uh, who need treatment. As we make advances in substance abuse uh, treatment and prevention, medications are becoming an increasingly important tool. Uh, in addition to drugs like naloxone, medications such as methadone and buprenorphine significantly reduce the risk of overdose, and individuals on these medications are in fact in recovery. Um, I'd like to just end by saying that there, if you'd like more information about overdose and overdose prevention, you can find out more information and about how to obtain naloxone. I encourage you to visit stopoverdose.org. Uh, stop and then finally, if you know someone with a behavioral health condition, if you know somebody who needs treatment or you have questions yourself, the Washington Recovery Helpline is an is a, a important resource in our community, and they can be reached at one 866-789-1511. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I now have the honor to introduce uh, Sean Good, who is runs uh, Choose 180. Um, I had the honor of first meeting Sean when I first became mayor and have been very impressed with the program. They have, are reaching youth by having credible messengers and working with folks to decide to really meet them where they are. Um, I had a number of the people they work with, youth come and meet me with me here not too long ago, right before the holidays. And I was so impressed with not just the level of caring that Choose 180 has in, in working with people in, the, in their lives, but also the, the response that they've generated. Um, hearing from each one of those youth as they went around the table in terms of how they got their challenges and how they could see a path forward and how for some of them, some of them for the first time, they saw hope in their own lives. And so, Sean, I can't thank you enough for the work that you and everyone else is doing. Why don't you come talk a little bit? Well, hello, everyone. I'm Sean Good, um, Steward Choose 180 as their executive director. We're a nonprofit organization that works to transform systems, communities, and lives through the power of choice. And we engage young people through strategic relationships with institutional leaders like Mayor Durkin herself, and partner with young people at pivotal moments to help them commit to a new direction, and help them honor that commitment by building communities of support around them. Support that looks like behavioral health, support that looks like mentors, support that looks like tutors, all the things that encompass a healthy community that we desire all of our young people to be enveloped by. So when the mayor reached out and asked if we would be willing to be a part of this very important conversation and this movement to take advantage of the opportunity that's set before us, it was uh, obvious for us to say yes. We serve 12 to 24 year olds, many of which don't fit the profile of what's promoted as the typical opiate abuser black and brown young people, LGBTQA plus young people, a variety of our community that often is forgotten in the conversation around opiate use. I'm grateful that 
because of the relationships we have, because of the credible messengers we employ, we'll be able to be an ally to engage young people in critical spaces throughout our community, help provide them these necessary trainings, and make sure they know how to access the equipment that could save their friends' lives. Whether it's they themselves that are currently using or friends that they're proximate to on a day in and day out basis, it's imperative they know that they can be more than just advocates, they can be heroes. And I say one thing before I close, that part of the power of this conversation is we're separating the problem from the person. When we inextricably tie problems to people, we strip them of their humanity. We don't take the moment to see them as gay. We see them as drug user. We don't take the moment to see them as the child, the teenager, the mother, the father, the cousin, the aunt, the uncle. We don't take that moment because we just look at the problem. But people are not problems, they're humans. We do problematic things by nature of our humanity, but those can be, if severed, can be solved individually and create a pathway to an opportunity, which is what we're leaning into today. So Mayor, thank you so very much for the space that you created for all of us. Thank you for the compassion in your hearts to allow that pain that you're feeling to inspire more than this moment that we're sharing together, but a movement that we can carry forward so all young people, whether they live in North Seattle or South Seattle, can benefit from this life-saving drug. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sean. Um, and now uh, I, some words from one of our newer council members, Council Member Strauss. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you both Deborah, Jed, my condolences are with your families, and David, um, thank you for your strength. Because if this can happen to a straight-A student, this can happen to anyone in any family. And we cannot allow Gabe's tragedy to not be turned into triumph. And that is why your strength is so important. And I'm so thankful to the mayor, to Sean, for community-based solutions where we know meeting people where they are with the solutions that they need is how we will stop and solve this epidemic. Um, we cannot and will not let this tragedy be forgotten. I am so relieved and thankful and excited that we will be able to turn this into a triumph where we increase the amount of education, prevention, and resources that we have all throughout the city, both in North and South Seattle. We know we need to invest in substance misuse prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation and I am honored to stand here with you and thank you for your strength. You are making our community, District 6 in Seattle, a better place to live in. Thank you so much. I'm going to take some questions in just a minute, but I do want to, I think what you see here is, you know, I have the great honor of being the mayor for Seattle and every day try to be out in a different part of this city. There is no part of Seattle that is not touched by the opiate crisis. Um, North Seattle, South Seattle, Southwest Seattle, Northwest Seattle, every part of our city and region has been touched by this crisis. And we've got to come together to find solutions to make sure that we are partnering with education, with credible messengers, and with the tools so people have the training and know that they can save someone's life. It is a different era, and just as you know, Medic One was the, pioneered here in Seattle and people knew what to do in a case of a heart attack, we've got to make sure that people know what to do if someone overdoses. Um, and we have to have the education up front and the credible messengers to try to get people not to use drugs, and then if they are, to help them in their recovery. But the reality is, is that we do have people who are using opioids and will continue to do. We have children who will experiment. Um, and what our job is, is to try to make people safe and try to give them as many avenues as possible to get support and have services to help them in their recovery and to prevent these from happening. So I just want to thank everyone up here who really represents that spectrum of commitment in our city and our region. Um, and with that, happy to take some questions on this topic for me or for any of the other people who are up here. Right here. The 700 uh, kits, uh, how does that number reach? Why not more or less? Is it a cost thing or just? 
I think it was, it's not a cost thing. We wanted to have a number that we could get them to the places we thought they needed to be deployed first and then assess how their use is. Um, I'm a big believer that I think that government can pilot, but then working with others, we can make sure that they duplicate that. So we're in the unusual position to be able to both start it, assess it, and educate people. So I, I think that, you know, we need to have it more available in more places and more people. And people need to be trained in it and realize that they too can save lives. Mayor, will these, um, can you talk a little bit more about where they'll be distributed? And besides schools, will they be distributed in libraries, for example? We're talking to the library system. We'd like them in the libraries. We want them, we're working with the school district right now. The nurses will be trained in them and we'll have some deployed there. We're working with nightlife so that they can be in bars and restaurants. Um, obviously, fire and SPD already have them. We're working with our partners at King County as well to make see what that infrastructure is. If you look at other areas, you know, we want though any place where it is likely that someone might overdose, which is actually almost anywhere, but the most likely places, we want there to be as quick a response as possible. Particularly with fentanyl, we're seeing that the um, period of time in which you have to administer Narcan is shorter, and sometimes you need a higher dose. And so having more availability is going to be a really important thing. Is the school thing new, um, or do they have them in there now at schools, or would this be a new thing? I think it is. I think yeah. the law passed it two years ago. Okay. They're not there yet. Yeah, the, it's a new law allowing it two years to implement. We'll get you more details specifically. Um, and as you know, Seattle Public Schools has been a great partner with us in a lot of things. We wanted to make sure that as we introduced it to the schools, it was going to those places the people would have some training to begin with. So that's why we're going to the nurses to start. What was the, what's the timeline on this? How soon will we start to see some of these kits in these places? It, it's going to be quickly. We can get you the whole implementation schedule. Let me get that to you. How much do these kids cost? That's a good question. I will get you that answer too. Is there a timeline for these town halls? There, we're in the process of arranging them. I think you're going to see them throughout the spring and summer. Um, we really want to make them to be uh, interactive, um, sometimes youth-led. We want them to be meaningful. The bottom line is, particularly for youth, they don't see themselves in adults. They see themselves in their fellow youth. And so we want to we want to generate that to be the basis for it and start those conversations and let them help lead, you know, where it is, who comes and the like. So we're in the process of doing that right now. Last question on fentanyl. Can I ask Jim a question? Um, what sort of what sort of drugs are we seeing fentanyl showing up in? Is it just in um, in drugs that people believe to be opiates, or um, you know, or is it other substances that are mixed with fentanyl? That I believe it's opioids. But that's what we're seeing, and I'm looking to my uh, counterparts at. It's other things too. Yeah, it's other it's, things it's mixed as well. With cocaine, marijuana. It's mixed in ecstasy. Um, there's an excellent book called Fentanyl Inc. And the author has offered to come and speak to us. He's a well-known author. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, that's great. Thank but, you. But most kids, the kids who are, are that I mentioned, are not, notwithstanding, are actually found with other things in it. And interestingly, cocaine is a commonly mixed drug with it. So thank you. Yeah, and currently, and, and for the mic, thank you. Brad Fine. Yeah, Brad Fine, good public health, Seattle King County. So, as Judd said. Um, Across the country, fentanyl is showing up in, in many different arenas. Here locally, what we're primarily seeing is fentanyl show up in um, counterfeit M30 pills, like counterfeit oxycodone pills. Um, uh, the Seattle Police Department, um, almost all of their seizures of um, pills in 2019, over 95% of them have contained fentanyl in them. So they're primarily in these fake uh, bluish um, pills. Often, um, sometimes they, it comes in powder, but it's almost, um, almost exclusively in pills. Any more questions on fentanyl? I want to add one thing that, you know, we are, public health, I can't thank them enough for the work they do across and to kind of see where the trends are in Seattle. Um, we're already starting to see a trend up the West Coast where some of the opiates are now being replaced by meth again and meth is a particularly dangerous drug in terms of because Narcan and the like don't work for it. So, you know, you may hear of that on the rise, but we are working really hard to figure out strategies both to intercept it, but also to educate youth and others um, and seeing what 
ex, you know, t kinds of treatment might be available. Right now there's none that is accepted in the scientific community, but there are some promising avenues that we might be able to try here. So any questions, any more on fentanyl? And then if there's any other questions, I'll take them. Dan. Uh, on, uh, on the um, tax bill that dropped yesterday in Olympia, um, uh, why support um, uh, a revenue raising option that needs state approval rather than something that the city uh, or the county could do on its own already? So the, the bill that has been dropped is a regional approach to, to raise money and revenues so that we can get more affordable housing, homeless services, and public safety throughout the county. Um, I'm very supportive of the approach. It's very early in the session. There's a uh, number of things to be determined and it's a short session. So I think that we will continue to work with the range of stakeholders who have an interest in the bill, city council, labor, businesses, legislators, um, to see if the the bill can move forward. But again, why, why, why uh, throw your support behind something that you need approval from, from another entity for rather than something the city could do on its own? There's nothing else pending, and so this is something that is actual pending. And so the question is, would we support this kind of effort? And absolutely, we are in a crisis right now. We've had over 140,000 people move here in a very short period of time. We didn't get enough housing, roads, etc. We need more housing as quickly as we can get it. And we need it every part of the region. We're seeing in Seattle more and more people priced out of this market, but we're also seeing that um, a, an increasing number of the people experiencing homelessness were not living in Seattle when they became homeless, but yet the services are here, but they come from other parts of the county. We just formed a regional authority um, on homelessness. We want to be addressing the housing and homelessness crisis on a regional basis. So it's, an, it's not a, I think that right now is, this is the bill that's been introduced. I think it would be a good approach. We're gonna to continue to work with people um, and we'll see if it, it goes anywhere. Along the lines of Dan's question, um, the, if I read the bill correctly, it's, it limits the amount that would go to Seattle to 43% of the revenues, um, leaving the rest for the rest of the county. Um, is that an acceptable balance to you? It's actually a little more complicated than that because some of the money will go directly to the regional authority and that money will be spent for the benefit of the whole county including Seattle. Um, in addition, money that goes to behavioral health in the county um, disproportionately goes to Seattle because of the population. So there's no, the, the formulas are not an exact number. Seattle will continue, I think, to, to, to receive uh, revenues. I think the thing that is really important here is right now this is the only proposal pending in a legislative body, and it raises approximately $100 million that we could start to spend next year to address this crisis. I'm very interested in making sure that we get real solutions, and so with the county executive supporting this endeavor, hoping as it moves forward, but we have to see how it plays out. We have to see how the bill changes in Olympia. We want to continue to work with all of our stakeholders, um, labor, businesses, council, uh, housing advocates and others to make sure we get it right. I've heard that uh, some business leaders may be interested in trying to get uh, a, something in this bill that says, okay, if, if the county exercises this taxing authority, this new taxing authority and does this, uh, the city can't uh, pass a head tax or something like that on its own in addition to. Uh, is that something that you think uh, should not be in this bill, should be in this bill? What do you think about that? I think it's too early to forecast what exactly is going to happen in this bill. And I think that people could speculate to a whole range of things that might end up in the bill. I think we have to continue to see what happens in the legislature, talk to legislators about it, and continue to work with the range of, of stakeholders, You know, as I said, including the city council, labor, businesses, community groups, housing advocates, um, and seeing at the end of the day, I think people want solutions. 
Um, and that's what my focus is going to be on, is how do we actually get solutions so we can start building more affordable housing and have better resources to address the crisis of homelessness. As you know, Sawant has the head, head tax round two debate. Um, so how do you think your, why do you think yours is a better approach to getting affordable housing versus what she is proposing right now? Well, actually, I, I saw, I, if I'm not mistaken, she released a statement today saying that she welcomed this approach in Olympia as well. So I think that that is, I was heartened by that because I think it shows that everybody wants a solution. Um, and we should be exploring every opportunity for solutions. This is the one that has been introduced in the legislature. It would deliver revenues that we could start spending next year to build affordable housing. So I'm, I'm looking at that saying, if this can pro pro provide a solution, then I want to work to help do that. In city leaders' perfect world, you, Sawan, and also Governor Inslee in there, um, you've got Governor Inslee proposing the $300 million for homelessness. Now you have you and Dow Constantine proposing this and Sawan's head tax. What do you say to the people out there who just feel like there's just tax overburden here in the state? What I hear from the people most is they want a solution. They want to know that government has a plan to help communities build more affordable housing and to deal with the crisis of homelessness. I hear that more than anywhere, anything else everywhere I go. Um, and it's not just a Seattle problem. If you talk in almost any town in Seattle has become so much more expensive and the amount of housing we have is too little. Um, and it's not just for low income, it's also for middle class. I received a report from my middle class advisory board last week and we have not kept pace there. So our teachers and our nurses they can't afford to live in Seattle and sometimes can't afford to live in other places in King County. We're seeing our whole hospitality industry. Um, you know, we all have our favorite restaurants, but those minimum wage workers now are commuting further and further to get to their jobs, um, which puts pressures on them and on the small businesses. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be very solution based. We know that we need more revenues to build affordable housing. Um, I'm heartened that both labor and business have recognized this problem. They think there might be a solution in Olympia. It might not work, but I think we have to try to make it work if we can, because we need a solution yesterday, um, and, and people are tired of waiting. Mayor Your Durkin. opponents to this are already trying to label it as Seattle's failed head tax with a new coat of paint. What do you want to say about that? I think that, you know, I, again, am very heartened that I've seen support from businesses and labor, from the council and stakeholders. It's early. Everybody wants to see exactly what the parameters of it are. But I know for certainty people want more affordable housing in King County and Seattle. We need it. We have to build it. And in order to do that, we have to find an approach that works. Mayor, you mentioned support from uh, business and labor. Who specifically, what businesses, what labor organizations? I think that's still in the works. And I have, I've had um, some conversations, but I think that we are continuing. The bill was just dropped yesterday. Um, we want to make sure that we are working with everybody to see if this is a path forward to actually get a solution going. Um, there can be a lot of debate. Um, about a whole range of issues, but getting people to the table to really focus on those, I think, is part of the thing. And I think that Representative Macri, by, by introducing this bill, has really introduced a really important conversation in our region on how do we actually deliver some solutions. Um, I want to thank her for doing that and, and having the, the wisdom to say, let's start this conversation here at the state and county level so that we can maybe scope the solutions bigger. Last question. Do you think that the exemptions that are in the bill are appropriate for grocery stores, gas manufacturers, and uh, liquor stores? I think that, it, it again, what's written in the bill today won't be what's written in the bill in three weeks if it passes. My experience in Olympia is, is that there's always a lot of work done on bills, um, and so I think it's way too early to pass judgment on any part of that. Can I sneak it on my phone when sure. you talk about the crack in the <laughs> release the Kraken. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I hope it's not a rumor. No. <laughs> Thank you.